Um, welcome everyone, welcome. I see some very familiar names, which is always exciting and even more exciting. I see some new names that I don't recognize. So welcome everyone. Um, very excited to have you here for our webinar on administrative support for bringing philosophy into K-12 schools. Uh, my name is Allison Cohen and I am the president of Plato. And we are pretty excited about the lineup um, of webinars and roundtables that we have scheduled for this fall. So I'm just going to put a link in the chat that um, brings you to a flyer um, that will list all of the events that we have scheduled, all of the online events that we have scheduled for this fall. So without further ado, um, I will introduce our moderator for this evening. Um, Claire Katz, I've had the pleasure of working with Claire for many years now um, on Plato, and uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce her. Claire Katz is the Associate Dean of Faculty Affairs at Texas A&M University, where she is a professor of philosophy. She also holds the Murray and Celeste Baskin Chair in Distinguished Teaching and was named a Presidential Professor for Teaching Excellence. She conducts research and teaches courses at the intersection of philosophy, education, gender, and Jewish studies. She recently published Growing Up with Philosophy Camp, How Learning to Think Develops Friendship, Community, and a Sense of Self, and Philosophy Camps for Youth. She founded and directs p for c Texas and the Aggie School of Athens Philosophy Summer Camp for Teens. Um, it's our pleasure to have Claire as part of our academic advisory board at Plato um, and our pleasure to have her moderating tonight's webinar. I would just remind everyone uh, to please keep yourself on mute until the end. Um, we'll save time for questions and answers at the end, but if everyone could remain muted until then, that would be fantastic. Um, so without further ado, Claire, please take it away and introduce our wonderful panel of guests that we have tonight. Thank you, Allison. Um, thanks for that introduction. And I realize I probably need to update my uh, my bio. I'm I'm actually now over in the um, School of Education at Texas A&M, so trying to, in my own subversive way, um, put philosophical inquiry into teacher preparation. So I've actually moved from the philosophy department over to the School of Ed, which I'm really enjoying. Okay, so I'd like to go ahead and introduce our um, panelists. I'm gonna, just going to do this in alphabetical order. Um, Christina Camerano, um, she emigrated from Italy to the United States, where she is an associate professor of philosophy at Salisbury University and director of the Bell Events program in the Honors College. She has a PhD in philosophy and education from Teachers College, Columbia University, and is a Whiting Foundation Public Engagement Fellow. Christina leads a program of philosophy in schools in collaboration with the county public schools. She likes to think of philosophy as an education for all human persons. Her research interests include historical conceptions of inquiry and travel in relation to education, the public dimensions of philosophy, especially but not only philosophy in schools and the experience of migrants in multicultural societies. Katie May has been a principal for the past 12 years, nine of them at Thurgood Marshall Elementary in Seattle. Prior to that, she was a school counselor she has worked in both independent and public schools. She is passionate about opportunities for students to share their thinking and to have a voice in their school experience. Colin Pierce has been an educator for 14 years and is a passionate advocate for, equi for equity in education and elevating youth voice and agency in the matters most important to them. He taught at Rainier Beach High School in South Seattle for eight years and coached teams in the Washington State Ethics Bowl for seven. Born in Oakland, California, he received his bachelor's degree from Sarah Lawrence College and his master's of arts in teaching from Lewis and Clark College. He currently works for the city of Seattle's Department of Education and Early Learning and serves on the Washington State Leadership Board among other volunteer activities. And finally, John Rockwell earned his BA in international relations from Syracuse University, but he has always been interested in philosophy as a hobby. He earned his master's degree in elementary education from the College of New Jersey, earning endorsements in middle school social studies and ELA. After working abroad in Qingdao, did I pronounce that right? Uh, Qingdao. Qingdao, thank you. Number one international school of Qingdao, China, as a six to eight social studies teacher, he moved on to teach 
five through eight humanities at Brownington Central School in Brownington, Vermont. Lately, John has become the five through eight humanities teacher at Greenbrook Middle School, where he is transitioning the department into one primarily focused on ethics. So at first, I just wanna thank our four panelists for being here this evening. Um, I think that this is one of the more the most important sides of the um, philosophy in the schools is how do you persuade the administrators to, to do this, you know, to provide the support. So I'm gonna just start by posing a kind of general question to all four of you, and you can sort of tweak it depending on where you are in relationship to the schools. So the first part of the question is, what prompted you to introduce K-12 philosophy into the school? So whether you're on the outside like Christina is or on the inside um, like the, the other three of you are, what prompted you even to want to sort of move in that direction? How did you, if you weren't already in a school, how did you identify the schools or the, the classes or the teachers if it wasn't going to be you um, who was going to do this? And how are you able to persuade your administrators to support you? So there's three sort of parts to that. Okay, so who wants to start? I'd be happy to um, jump in there. Okay, um, Katie, go ahead. Thanks. So we had um, a parent actually of one of our students who was in the philosophy program, um, a doctoral student at the University of Washington and involved with philosophies in the schools. And um, she had approached me about it. And um, I just was trying to picture what that would look like at the elementary school level, where we're a pre-K pre to fifth grade school. And so it may have been partly my curiosity as much as anything else. She started with one class and then it just gradually grew and expanded. Um, what really helped us to be able to make it part of what we do is figuring out ways that we could integrate and, um, and use the philosophy that was happening to move us forward towards other goals. Um, at our school, we, we're a little bit of an unusual school. We're a large elementary school and we have three primary programs. One that's intensive special ed um, for kids that are self-contained for a large chunk of their day, although we include as much as we can. And then we have kids that live in our neighborhood, which is a pretty high poverty setting, um, very multi-ethic, multiracial, and multilingual. And then we also are a site for one of the district's highly capable programs. So that is also sort of a self-contained program for much of the day, but we had gone through a waiver process in order to blend our students for social studies. So for us, um, kids learning together um, without the bounds of their programs um, is, a, is a really important goal because we feel like that's very much part of the equity for our school is all kids learning together at high levels. So the philosophy program fit with our social studies goals really nicely. We're really focused on um, one, geography, kids knowing where they came from and where they are now, and also kids being able to speak up for injustices, recognize and speak up for injustices that they see in the world around them. So philosophy is such an important piece of that. We, we really are seeing that kids are learning how to become great thinkers, and that has to be in place even before they become great speakers and great writers about their, their practice. So um, for us, it was really working with um, philosophy teachers who were really open to integrating, who wanted to know what was happening with the class, both socially as well as what was happening in the curricula, and being willing to partner with teachers to, to make those pieces fit together. Before we move on to the other three, can I can I ask you like sort of follow up? So did you when when this person came to you, did you know what philosophy for children was or what a, a K-12 philosophy program was? To be honest, I had heard um, from relatives and also other principals <laughs> who had had it in their schools. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't ever really dug into it. Our program are, has a lot of different community partners already. So I wasn't necessarily looking to expand that, but I had a high regard for this parent and had worked with her closely around some issues that her own child was going through. And she, she worked on me a little bit, but um, you know, it was, it was pretty easy to soften me up to it because it really was about helping kids think through issues, which is what we were already trying to do. And where did she know about it? Do you know how she knew about it? Yes, yeah, she was actually, she was a doctoral student at the University of Washington in the philosophy. Oh, okay. Okay. And she oh, had been working at other schools as well. Oh, that's great. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So who would like to go next? Um, I could go next if that would okay. Um, work. Okay. 
So um, what initially, I guess, prompted me to introduce ethics to my school was the premise that I was hired under by my superintendent, which is like a unique, I guess, like extra class that he added to the school. And the idea is that I have to create my own class, like my own unique, like signature class. And so um, I was just like kind of thinking about, okay, I have total freedom to kind of like make whatever class I want. So I was, but also like the idea that the class is supposed to be kind of like an enrichment class to a, to a degree, or like that's the expectation. So um, I was thinking that, so my school is a public school and um, generally, I guess there's, there, there seems to be a framework for, for at least like most public schools that um, children are learning essential knowledge and skills for a college and career readiness. Like that's really like the focus a lot of the time. So what seemed to be missing from um, the nature of typical classes in school is both creating strong foundations for children and also helping them really grapple with like bigger picture issues. Um, and an SCL curriculum is present as well as an ELA curriculum, of course, but there doesn't really seem to be a thorough and comprehensive toolkit available for students today to think through a lot of complex issues that will arise in humanity's future. And um, this was kind of like what I was saying to administrators in a big pitch that I was making about like this new program I want to do. Um, so, and also like to touch on like equity issues, I said something along the lines of like, what people think is right and wrong is the critical aspect of how power is exercised in society. And so if students can be more aware of these dynamics, they can focus more on how to ground themselves in strong, clearly reasoned perspectives in relation to solving very complex problems, even problems that we're not really fully aware of today or problems that we are aware of, but we, but you know, the adults of today don't know how to solve. Um, and of course, like they're not gonna learn how to actually solve the problems, but they can at least get early exposure and development of like reasoning or cognitive tools to solving the problem. Um, another thing I used to kind of really sell the program was like this, this has a t like ethics has a tons of it uh, has a ton of potential to be interdisciplinary. So like there are as many ethical issues out there as there are real world disciplines or classes that contain ethical issues. So like, you know, as far as like the common core goes, um, I've also been undergoing a huge um, and like, I guess, initiative this year to really strengthen um, like, well, the whole district has to, so I have to as well like strengthen the all curriculum to be really um, rigorous in terms of common core state standards. So even for what I've been developing so far, I mean, there's potential for me to be developing technology standards, music standards, performing arts standards, ELA standards, like there's tons of ways I can go with it. So I think that was also a big selling point for them. Um, and also I'm just really passionate about philosophy. I always have been. So um, I think that also came through in my presentation and led to them, I guess, uh, accepting it more. So yeah, that's that's my two cents. That's interesting. So I mean, just like thinking about the difference. So in your case, John, one of the differences is you actually had a mandate, in some so, sense. Yeah. To, I mean, I mean that helps, right? To be asked to develop a class, and then it sounds like. Um, you were able to take the um, material that was in that class and then persuade people that this would actually be helpful in a variety of other classes. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, okay, that's great. Okay, Colin or Christina, who would like to go next? <laughs> I, I can go. Okay, Christina. Yeah, so um, the, the way that I got started was, um, in, in some ways, you know, I, when I interviewed for that job um, at Salisbury University, they asked me what I could do uh, for civic engagement. And I told them, well, I can do philosophy in schools. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and somehow I think um, um, the committee, you know, liked the idea. I think they were also trying to find, my department has a long tradition of community engagement. So I think they were, and, and in that tradition, Claire, as you know, um, uh, philosophy in schools has been part of that tradition, though it had died out um, in the decade before I, I joined the department. So from the department point of view, that was like something that I could do. But then of course the problem was getting into the school. 
And, uh, <laughs> and uh, similarly to what Katie was saying, at the time, one of my colleagues had uh, two children in the local elementary school. So he was very um, keen to um, uh, organize a first meeting with the principal. So before even finding an apartment where to stay in Salisbury, I had a meeting set up with the principal in like July. <laughs> and so I went and, um, you know, described the program. Um, I think she was very fond of my colleague and of his two children. Uh, and so she was kind of like maybe a bit primed to trust us. And um, uh, so she decided to give it a try, but she told me I should go to their planning meeting and talk to the teachers because she wasn't going to force any teacher to do it. And so then I went and spoke with the teachers and I had some who were interested. And so that's kind of how we started. And then after finding the teachers, I had to convince the superintendent that it was okay. You know, it's a small county that we have. And so um, I, I had a lot of institutional support. So my dean organized a meeting with the superintendent and, uh, and then, you know, I described the benefits of P4C, I you know, described critical thinking, how you're order thinking, how it benefits, especially um, children who are otherwise um, um, uh, have fewer opportunities for a variety of reasons, you know, so I kind of convinced everyone. And so that's how we got started. Um, the other question you were asking, Claire, was about how did I select which teachers? And, uh, um, I didn't really, I proposed, and then uh, the teachers who were interested contacted me. I actually really appreciated the way that the principal went about it because um, at that point, I think it was really important that it wouldn't feel forced upon the teachers. There's already so much that, uh, I was a, a public, I was a, um, a high school teacher too before coming to, to the States. So, you know, I know how much it's kind of just foisted upon you when you're in um, a classroom teacher. Uh, so uh, um, they kind of opted into the program. And then at some point I had the problem that I had too many teachers that wanted to do it. And uh, it's only me and the students, but you know, pretty much it's me. And so uh, that, um, that required some creative scheduling on my side, but I was always able to work with any teachers who wanted to do it. And did you train the teachers or were you the one going in and doing the facilitation? Well, I have done both. So I started by going in and doing the facilitation with my college students. So I mainly trained my students to do that. Um, and uh, then at some point it had, the volume had become too much. And luckily at the same time, I had received a pretty uh, substantial grant. So I was able to organize a week long um, summer institute for mm -hmm. teachers. So then the 18 teachers who came to that, they, they were really encouraged to start introducing philosophy in their classes in the way that they found um, appropriate. And, and then I kept collaborating with those teachers. Mm -hmm. um, but um, unfortunately, both COVID and uh, mm -hmm. yet another turnover in superintendents. I've been um, here in Maryland for eight years. I have seen three superintendents, uh, five principals at the main school that I collaborate with. Wow. So there's so much to never, and every time I have to start from scratch. Right, right. Right, <laughs> so, right now things have kind of died out. I've right. come back into the school, but with one teacher. And, and do uh, you have the same dean that is the same dean yeah. at Salisbury? So at least that person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is consistent and can tell the same story and can right, right. try to and he loves the program. He came <laughs> once to the school. Um, he came once to the school. We were doing philosophy of science with a a, a fourth grade and mm -hmm. uh, my dean. Well, not to you know, he's a kind of an awkward Dutch Canadian, very tall and a bit awkward, right? Mm -hmm. So he comes into the classroom and uh, and at the end of the of the lesson, the kids gave me a hug and then they went and gave him a hug. And uh, so he told that story for like the next two years about you know doing philosophy <laughs> of science with the children and all that. So he loves the program and he supports it, meaning he lets me do it. Right. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> sure, right. But yeah. Let me ask you one more one more question. Do you um do you think because I know I know Salisbury. I don't know mm -hmm. that anybody else here knows knows the <laughs> area, but do you think that it helps? I mean, it's a it's a um it's a small sort of tight knit community. Mm -hmm. Um, for a long time, it was isolated on the eastern shore. You know, in the fifties oh. before the bridge went up, and but it still sort of sees itself as very separate from yeah. the rest of Maryland. Um, and at least when I was there, there was, I think just the one high school, I don't know if there's more than one high school, but I guess what I'm wondering is, do you think it, so on the one hand, it helps that you have a Dean mm -hmm. who supports the program and can tell a story to the superintendent. It probably also helps. You can tell me if I'm wrong, that they probably know each other, that the Dean probably knows the superintendent. There's mm -hmm. probably you know, a close relationship, at least in terms of wanting to recruit students from the high school or students wanting to come to Salisbury. So I'm just wondering if that makes a difference that um, the dean and the superintendent, however many there have been, um, know each other. And so that dean might have more credibility. I'm just curious what you think. You would know the area better. Yeah. Um, the, so the second superintendent came from across the bridge that for us is like saying, come from the moon. Uh, so, you know, um, <laughs> the, 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 this new one that just started out um, is, you know, in-house, so mm -hmm. that he was already working for the superintendents, mm -hmm. and at some point, one of the finalists was someone who got his uh, doctorate with us, and so mm -hmm. we're kind of hoping uh, in the education mm -hmm. department, but mm -hmm. it didn't work out. I think, Claire, what you're really spot on is that um, this being um, a small community and in a lot of ways, maybe a little narrow-minded, but uh, mm -hmm. it, it's also in, in other ways good because at this point, um, you know, I do a lot with social media. We are old, so Facebook works well. And, you know, I tag all the teachers every time I do something and then they compliment me. Like, and so there's a lot of communication. And um, I also do, I don't know if it's a good moment to talk about it, but I also do a summer camp for high schools. And then the students in the high school, from time to time, try to start philosophy clubs in their schools. Oh, uh -huh, right? uh -huh. And so in some years it works, uh -huh. in others it doesn't. Right. Again, it depends on, because they need to find a teacher who has to stay over time for free and because it's not recognized, they don't get paid. Mm -hmm. Right. And so right. 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 <laughs> uh, right. it's a, a bit of a mixed bag. But again, so, you know, I think they start hearing from several, um, from several parts that philosophy can be done and there's you know it's not dangerous and right. um and all that so at least we do have a positive <laughs> buzz going around i think right you know we laugh but i'm in texas and i they really did think it was dangerous so, oh yeah um yeah and you know for that's, us that's, too, that's a different like, story uh, yeah yeah i think uh, you know especially you know some teachers are a bit scared mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. Um, but then they see it and um, they they change their mind from, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it's not, I mean, it, it's a radical exercise, but it's not that we go there and indoctrinate kids, you know, like, it's really just about um, letting children's voices, someone was talking about it uh, earlier, uh, letting children's voices come through and helping them find right. their thinking. Right. So teachers come to love that. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Colin, you're on. There's there's so much that's come up in the space since the question was asked that I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best to to stick to answering the question. But I yeah I, I do think to the question of of uh, danger. I there's there's reason for a lot of teachers to fear that they're gonna be handed the the hemlock um, you know in, or the, the modern version of it soon enough, which is worrying for sure. Um, so I, you know, I can speak to this from from both the side of a uh, classroom teacher and kind of instructional leader implementing it inside the school, and and I'm also like right now I'm outside of schools and collaborating with schools, and so can can speak to it from that perspective too. But um, for the the first piece of it, just a little bit of context: the school that I was teaching at for the majority of of the last decade um, is called Rainier Beach High School, and Seattle's a, a very segregated city uh, in many ways, um, which creates really high concentrations of student populations who have been historically um, poorly served by public education. And, and Rainier Beach um, has among the higher concentrations 
of um, those student populations. So, you know, whether you can you can run down the list, whether it's talking about student homelessness, um, speakers of uh, a language other than English at home, poverty, um, you know, racial demographics, et cetera. Uh, and and the school over the course of about a decade had been um, emptying of student population to the point where around 2010, 2011, um, there were fewer than uh, 300 students in a building built for, for about 1,500. So as, as a part of an attempt to avoid shutting down the school, the community um, came together and decided that they wanted to implement an international baccalaureate program at the school. Um, and, uh, and as a part of that process, looking at it not just as a as kind of a, a magnet program for the student populations who weren't already attending the school, but really as a way of saying, no, this is for exactly for the kids who are left here, um, uh, who haven't fled the school community. Um, we're not trying to bring more affluent, more white parents into the school necessarily. And so, um, so around that time, I was hired as the IB coordinator um, and also as the teacher of the theory of knowledge class. So for those of you who aren't familiar with, with IB, um, one of the required elements in the diploma program is a theory of knowledge class, which is, um, yeah, I mean, it's a philosophy class in in some ways, and and I would say in the same ways that that P4C at the the elementary level is, where uh, you're not teaching students about philosophy, you are um, you are giving students space to be philosophers, and um, and asking them questions and allowing them to pursue and ask questions that are meaningful to them. So with with this uh, with the mandate from the community, which I think is you know if we're if we're talking about administration support for anything at all, um, having parents and the broader community want it is a probably the best way to <laughs> to go about convincing um, the leader of a, a school community to do something. Um, so so in terms of of what prompted it, um, it, really it was the it's the fact that this is a core part of the IB curriculum. Um, but I linked up with uh, Plato Foundation, then the um, University of Washington Center for Philosophy for Children, uh, because they were starting up the High School Ethics Bowl. And um, that was uh, it was something that, that I felt like this would be perfect for our students. Um, and the Ethics Bowl cases were incredible ways of exploring um, ethical concepts and reasoning. Um, and uh, and so that was that was partly what prompted it as well. Um, what what we saw as we were implementing this and seeing the the theory of knowledge class not just as a sort of a class for a subset of students, but something that we wanted all students to have access to, um, was that that students who were um, disengaged in other classes uh, were completely different in this class. Um, we're, we're finding their voice, we're finding agency, we're finding engagement in this class to the point where I had a few students who were not enrolled who would skip their classes um, to come sit in on mine, which I don't condone. And at the same time, um, it was it was incredible to have these, these students present and contributing to the conversation and engaged in the conversation. Um, and one of them, Malik, uh, I recently, he's, he's probably 25 now, um, but he recently posted something on Facebook about um, how, how much he loves having ethical conversations and, and now as an adult. And, and this is a kid who um, just was, was dropping into the class every now and again. Um, so um, so I, I think that there is, there's an element of the way that students talk about the experience that, that ends up spreading support for it throughout a school community. Um, there's, in terms of identifying teachers, one of the requirements of the IB program is also that theory of knowledge um, concepts be touched on in all subject area classes. So um, that made it a little bit easier to convince folks to get involved with it, but it's still a challenge. I think that, you know, the, um, the things that are barriers to a lot of education um, reform efforts, um, whether it's talking about sort of siloing of curriculum and, and of disciplines, um, whether we're talking about sort of initiative fatigue, um, the turnover, you know, Christina, talking about turnover and leadership, um, all of those things are, are going to be barriers to, to something like um, philosophy for children, unfortunately. And, and um, so that, that siloing piece was a real challenge or the, or the, the feeling that teachers need to cover um, 
all of this core content and that they can't possibly dedicate units to the you know, X, Y, and Z. Um, so, uh, so part of what I did in order to build support uh, for this within the school was was providing the experience of, of what it's like to be a, a student in that class. Um, so, and and thankfully, because of the broad support for implementing the IB program, it was really easy um, to get administrative support for anything that might bolster it. So, um, so for example, using there's a set of of prompts that uh, the theory of knowledge class has for um, one of their assessments that are questions like. Um, uh, how do historians and human scientists give knowledge meaning through the telling of stories? Um, so big, broad questions like that, or um, uh, how can we distinguish between good and bad interpretations? And using those as icebreakers at the beginning of faculty meetings was one way of getting folks talking and experiencing this and seeing some of the ways that they might link it to their um, their core content. Um, the so, so that's kind of from the the inside implementing it and and trying to do it as a classroom teacher and kind of quasi administrator. Well, that's exciting, Justin. I'm glad to glad to see an IB graduate in the in the mix. Um, the uh, from from the outside um, as so right now my role I support ten schools who are receiving City of Seattle grant dollars. Um, Katie's school is one of them. Um, full disclosure, and I'm. Feel very very lucky to get to work with their good Marshall um, and their and and the support their work. Um, so I I mean I've, I'm I'm an evangelist in in one way or another. I tried not to be pushy, but like I am an evangelist for this and because I've seen the the difference it makes in students' experiences. And and so from the outside, I think you know the the challenge is some of the things that I mentioned before. Um, considering the the position of a principal of a school administrator. Um, the number of initiatives that are that are mandated, the number of community partners um, who are volunteering, um, it's uh, it's a challenge for them to sort through what's going to be worthwhile, and they need to they need to be gatekeepers. Um, otherwise, it's chaos in in their schools and chaos in their own sort of um, management processes. So I, I do think Katie had mentioned this earlier, but. Um, uh, looking at how this is a means towards achieving goals that other, you know, that the school already has, I think is a really important um, starting point in terms of persuading from the outside. Um, and, and also, I, I think that the, the relationship development, I, I think that each of the other three panelists touched on this, the relationship development and maintenance are a really core part of how and why you might choose to do something like this or continue to do something like this. And so continue, you know, just keeping up those relationships and starting to understand the motivations. Um, I, you know, I know several schools who have been hesitant because they're worried that it's going to further entrench inequities in their schools, that the, you know, more affluent parents are going to scramble to have their kids be a part of philosophy um, in schools, and it's going to leave the rest of the students behind. So being able to speak to those concerns, I think, is a, is a really important part uh, of all of that. I'll 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 stop there because there's so there's so much that everybody else raised that I I'm like curious to hear more about and I want to hear more from them. And and Claire, can I just add on to something that Colin yeah, said? Sure, because of course. the piece about inequities was really important for us. We wanted to make sure we already have a situation at our school where you know we're literally calling some students highly capable, which makes other kids automatically feel less than. Um, and historically, that program has been very white and upper middle class versus our kids that live in the neighborhood that, that we serve. So that was a really important thing for us. And we had insisted initially with the UW's philosophy department that we would only do it if we could do it with mixed groupings mm -hmm. and to really help further our goals around equity for kids in education too. And of course they were all about that. And um, it really did help us provide more content and curriculum for kids in these mixed settings. Yes, thank you. I was actually going to ask about the inequities, so thank you. Yeah, yep. I mean, do you do you think that you are um, battling a perception with either administrators or parents or families that philosophy is for gifted kids or for wealthy kids or for white kids? That um, that part of the battle is actually breaking through the perception of who philosophy is for or 
who can benefit from philosophy or who would find philosophy meaningful or anything like that? I, absolutely. I, I think that that's, um, that's it's pretty core to, to some, mm -hmm. some of the struggle. I, I think that, mm -hmm. that if, if we as a society felt that philosophy was, um, was more useful, we would mandate it as a part of state <laughs> curriculum, right? There's, there is a broad sense that it is useful. Well, that goes back to the danger point, right? I mean, well, yeah, no, exactly. Like it's, <laughs> it's, it's, danger, like, it's useful. It's just there's, not useful. There's, <laughs> there's, that, there's that, like a fantastic episode of, or a scene from an, uh, an episode of The Simpsons where uh, Lisa's asking a question and the teacher is repeatedly pressing an independent thought alarm button. Under the <laughs> and, and I think that, I mean, I like it's real. It's, it's a real thing, I think. Um, and uh, it becoming even, you know, increasingly more real. Um, that, so, so yes, there is like those perceptions of the field of philosophy and what it means to be doing philosophy um, are something you need to battle against. And, and in some cases, like I, I would use my students going to the ethics bowl, um, they, were, they were right. They showed up and, and for a number of years were um, the only team comprised entirely of students of color. Hmm. Um, and, um, and they, we would debrief afterwards and they would talk about how weird it felt um how they how, how they aren't you know, seattle's a segregated city students who aren't white are not spending tons of times in time in white spaces and um and i it was an incredibly valuable experience for them but it was a really difficult experience for them and the the plato found you know like plato and or, you know then university of washington center for philosophy for children did an incredible job responding to that to to like the feedback that they had but i think that it's like yes we need to battle those perceptions and sometimes those perceptions are are real um, and we need to understand how that factors into the choices we make for for programming for kids and and how we how and why we expose them to it mm -hmm. thanks so do you want to ask each other, I have more questions, but I'd actually, I mean, just getting you started, I would rather hear, and I'm assuming everybody on the Zoom would rather hear from the four of you if you have questions for each other, or if you want to pick up on the point that came, came up earlier about the danger and um, the perception that that has and how that might um, uh, provide resistance from schools or administrators or parents, you know, or families, or even the kids. Um, so which, whatever, if you want, if you want me to keep asking questions, I can do that, or I can just let you go with what we've already started with. I, I, I wonder if I can continue a little bit on this idea of the equity or inequity, um, sure. the, in the perception of philosophy, because that has been a real challenge for me. And it took a lot of trial and error, and um, it, it is still a little bit of a problem. Like, so to give you an example, uh, three, well, before the pandemic, and so before times, I happened to work with uh, two very bright philosophy students who were also bilingual with Spanish. And so we dreamt up this bilingual program where we would do uh, philosophy for children in uh, with, uh, children who came to the school with Spanish as a, a home language. And, um, and we know that some of them are just kind of like thrown in the middle of the year, you know, like, so we were trying to convince the elementary school principal that that was a good idea. And, uh, and we had a beautiful curriculum that I had bought from Spain. It's a visual curriculum with Spanish and English. So we were ready, right? And we thought we'd do translanguaging, trans so we'd move from the two languages and just let it be an, an open space. And the principal uh, did not let us do it because he thought that the kids needed tutoring rather than philosophy. And I was trying to tell him how frustrating is must be not being able to access a certain type of thinking just because the language of instruction is not the language you're most familiar with and how I thought that having that experience could actually help them in general, but he didn't hear it. Um, so he didn't let us do it. <laughs> so, you know, we then went to the uh, local Catholic church uh, who uh, gave us a space uh, where we could do 
homework help and literacy and stuff with, with families who needed to, um, that type of service that we knew were mainly uh, Latinx families. So we kind of like worked around it, but the principal didn't let us do it because he didn't believe that those students could benefit from philosophy. Um, and, um, you know, I give it up because at the end of the day, I need this relationship more than I can fight it. And so um, I just went somewhere else to do it. Uh, so I'm, it's very encouraging to hear that in your schools, there seems to be more awareness of this issue because I'm, I had a bit of trouble with that. Christine, I think, I think that's a, it's an issue that I see uh, in, in a number of the schools that I work with is the battle between enrichment and and sort of um, academic support. And it's like finding that balance and recognizing that that um, being, uh, you know, not testing particularly well or not having, um, uh, you know, being behind on the standards doesn't mean you should be denied access to um, non-academic enrichment. In fact, maybe it means that you need greater access to it. And I'm sure Katie, in the way that, that you set up the, your work um, at Thurgood Marshall, like that's, I, I know that's a, a core consideration. It is for us. I mean, you know, when I think about what we want students to leave our school with, yes, we'd love for them to be at grade level standard in all of their subjects or above, but ultimately we're preparing citizens. And so I think the most important thing is that we have kids who understand how to learn and the importance of learning and keeping learning once they're out of school and as adults and pursuing their interests and passions and finding those things that they're passionate about and also being able to think for themselves. And if we can accomplish that, then I'm less worried about what our, what our scores say. Um, I do sit in a privileged position, I think, because, you know, in where we are and the clientele that we're drawing from, we do have um, a fairly large percentage of our parents who are pretty liberal and would support things like philosophy. Um, and that, and we sort of ride that wave of enthusiasm about the work that we're doing in terms of social justice and equity, which is great. We, we also do a lot of educating of our parents about why we do what we do and make the choices that we make and the importance of those things. So I think, you know, constantly retelling the story of where we came from and why we need to blend students together and how that's equitable for them. That's an important piece of the work. I think that I do, because I, I feel like I'm the chief storyteller to kind of keep the, um, the culture that we've built going. Um, I think what, um, I think it was Colin who said, or maybe Christina about, you know, the, the administrators who are there, that makes such a difference. And when there's schools that have a constant um, shuffle of who's leading the school, it makes it really tricky to keep any kind of initiative going, let alone something that might be seen as, you know, extra or an add-on. And so I think, you know, that idea of integration and how does, how does the work of philosophy in the schools, how does that fit with the work that we already do? One, so that teachers don't see it as, oh gosh, here's something else I have to make time for, versus this is something that complements what I'm already doing or maybe even extends it. And um, you know, how 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 can a school feel like, oh, that philosophy, it's indispensable. We really need to have it. Um, and you know, for us, the other, another piece that we haven't really talked about is the finances to pay for it because it is an extra thing. And we were very fortunate because we're a Title I school you know, that, that our, our person who is running philosophy here in Seattle, Jana Moore, um, gave us a very, very budget friendly deal to be able to pay for it. And without that, I don't know that we could have done it. And that, you know, um, that initial little foray into philosophy for us turned into having our own philosopher in residence who could, you know, give us 10 hours a week, every week. So um, that was a huge part of it as well as, you know, making making it so that we were able to afford something that is no longer a luxury for us, but more of a necessity. That's interesting, the, the philosopher in residence. I want to come back to that. But before we move on, I wanted to ask um, John if um, either you have issues similar to these if, or if you've experienced issues similar to these with regard to inequities, if those came up in what you were doing. And then also going back to the danger issue, just to sort of keep that, you know, on the front burner, especially because one of the things that you're doing with ethics, it's hard not to think that 
I don't know what issues you know are coming up, but it's hard not to think that it would finger out into issues that somebody might think of as dangerous. You know, philosophy obviously, of course, in itself is dangerous just in terms of thinking, but you're doing something more explicit. So I'm wondering if you could speak to either of those two those two points. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so as of now, there um, there has been resistance from parents to incorporating some of these issues into the curriculum. However, I guess a way that I've found around it for now is when these issues just emerge as part of student discussion, I talk about them. And um, I make sure to include as part of the rules for my class that being open to new perspectives and not exercising judgment upon others is like really critical to just how the class works. And so when the issues do come up, I make sure to you know, address them and to give space to what goes on. Um, there's also kind of a general perception from, um, from a lot of people uh, that like philosophy is just kind of like beside the point to what school is doing. And um, I've had to kind of, or so in, in order to kind of work a lot of this stuff and I think I'm gonna just organize a presentation for parents um, because another thing is that students have to choose my class in competition with a lot of other classes. So maybe to like build up more support for my classes, I would like, you know, prepare a presentation about how philosophy is not just like, you know, irrelevant to achieving, you know, good grades or to master in content. It actually helps with these goals. Um, so that's kind of what I would say for now with regard to where I'm at. Um, yeah, that's what I'll say. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's helpful. One of the things I, I, I have found though, um, it's hard to persuade administrators to take that leap of faith that squeezing philosophy in, which of course means squeezing something out, even if it's for a half hour, that this will actually still help. It isn't just something fun, you know, that it actually will, um, you know, be, you know, greater than the sum in a matter of speaking, but it's, you know, almost like a Kierkegaardian leap of faith that it's hard to persuade them just to try it, you know, because they, you know, they may see the studies, but they're not sure it's going to work for them or, you know, something along those lines. So it's kind of an, it's an interesting, it's an interesting problem. I know that with Texas, there's so much testing um, that takes up so much time that they they feel very stretched just to, you know, fit in the, the, the subjects that they have to cover. So this is actually really, this is really helpful. Does anybody want to, oh, go ahead, Colin, go ahead. I, well, I just, I think, I think to that point, um, in, in my experience for adults, experiential learning is so much more effective, right? And, and that it's also the thing that is hardest to do given the traditional structure of schools is to bring adults into a learning experience that's un that's unfamiliar or new or maybe bring them out to observe what's going on in another school where they might be successful with it but um but whether it's providing some some experience of what philosophy looks like in, in the classroom internal to the school or or bringing them out somewhere else i've just i've found that that's more effective than almost anything else um, to convince folks who might be skeptical um, or who can't see or can't envision um, how it might be done. Like ad adults' imaginations, unfortunately, um, uh, sometimes get worse over time. So Christina, have any of those superintendents ever come in to see the kids do philosophy? No. <laughs> No, absolutely. Like, I think uh, um, what I'm hearing about the schools in Seattle, it's so fascinating because um, I, you know, work in a different environment when, where um, there's pretty much nothing set up uh, for schools. Uh, so underserved, um, mm -hmm. being underserved is, is very real, partially um, because of the area and partially, yeah. There, 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 there are other issues as well. So um, a way that, um, you know, a way that I found interesting, interesting, I, I don't know, it, um, that the danger of philosophy kind of, kind of loses its edge is, um, so a lot of the schools that I work with have issues with discipline. So uh, one of the uh, first years that I was doing this, the chair of the math department at the local high school 
contacted me to ask if I could do a professional development to the math department uh, about discipline. <laughs> So I say yes to everything, right? And also, just for the record, everything's free. So, you know, we don't charge for any of these things, of course. I mean, in, in, I cannot in my position. Um, so I go and, uh, and you know, like I, in, we have a, a, like a, a morning long session about how to discuss uh, matters of ethics with adolescents. And, um, um, and, and so we did it with the, with the teachers themselves. And at first they were a bit shocked because they couldn't accept that I, I you know, my, my proposal that they should not tell the kids what's right and how to behave. Like they wanted to learn how to do that. And by the end of the morning, <laughs> they kind of agreed that it was more productive for what they had in mind to, you know, use a more philosophical approach to these discussions. Um, and I've had similar requests from principals to do maybe philosophy paired with the uh, school counselor uh, in, um, you know, during lunchtime or, you know, I don't do it instead of recess because I, I don't believe that that's appropriate. But, you know, like, so in, in, in my context, uh, maybe more than worried about the danger of philosophy, they are desperate for something that might um, in, in some ways uh, uh, maybe build up a little bit of affection for the experience of learning in schools. That seems, uh, that seems lost. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of one angle that I found where I can uh, sneak in um, the schools. Anybody else want to comment on that? I so this this is a, a conversation that that was happening in in a different context about the the connection between social emotional learning and and concepts like restorative justice and and philosophy and how that it's a natural it is a natural place to bring those conversations into schools and how we also don't want it to only live there um, that that looking at subject area. You know, sort of incorporation into into subject area learning is so important too. That it's not like okay, well, we leave our philosophical minds behind. You know, when we leave our so social emotional learning conversations or our you know twenty first century skills, and um, and I, I know this is a, it's a it's a bit of a, a shift from where we were going before, but I do think it's it's important and interesting to to think about how we start building those opportunities. Um, for teachers to see the place of it, whether it's whether it's the um, philosophical content or whether it's more of the like instructional, like it's the pedagogy, right, um, into their work otherwise. And this is, um, Katie, I'm I'm curious uh, uh, about what you've seen, and we've had it, we've talked about it a little bit before, but what you've seen around how um, having the philosopher in residence changes the the teacher. Uh, the instructional practice of the teacher that they're working with. I do think that um, a lot of the a lot of the curriculum that we've implemented over the last five years or so has really focused on less teacher talk and more student voice, which I think is exactly the right way to be going with that. And I do think that that experience for classroom teachers that are working closely with a philosopher they're definitely picking up from their practice, just like they do when the school counselor comes in. You can see that the teachers are learning new language or new skills and reinforcing the things that have happened in the lesson that they've observed. So um, I think it's it's very much the same with the philosopher in residence where, um, you know, they're, they, they have the experience of seeing someone who's asking questions and eliciting student thinking. And then they are taking on some of those, um, you know, maybe not, exactly to the same degree as someone who's really trained as a philosopher, but they're definitely picking up skills and things that they see happening and, and working well. I mean, they see how engaged the students are with the philosophy. Um, there was a question earlier in the chat about, you know, how do the kids do with, you know, are there some kids that just kind of jump into it more easily? And I think, you know, what we've seen is not, um, not a breakout along academic lines, like the kids who are super smart in 
reading or you know, are not necessarily the ones that are also like the quickest in philosophy. It's it really tends to be much more um about comfort and kids feeling comfortable to share. So kids who are very shy might be the ones that hang back a little bit more. And um, and the teachers, we really think about, you know, who are our kids furthest from educational justice that may not have a voice in all that we do and how do we help to center those voices? But I think, you know, philosophy really has been about centering the voices of kids, thinking about the airtime, you know, even using that as a lesson, you know, about equity and fairness. Um, and there was, uh, Kathy had commented in the chat also about social emotional learning. And I forgot to mention that that's a huge part of where philosophy often goes is, you know, there's conversations about gender and, and kids who identify as non-binary and that, I mean, we're not in Texas, Claire, so I don't know how that would play out where you are, but here we talk about it and the kids are so eager to talk about it and to ask questions and philosophy class is another way to really help those conversations happen in respectful ways so that, you know, kids really can talk about their differences and, you know, and, and really celebrate those in respectful ways and ask the questions that they're curious about without, um, you know, kind of leaning into the area where it starts to feel disrespectful. I was going to ask if, um, I, I don't know that this would happen in, in the, it, at the elementary level, although I, I, I don't rule anything out, but um, do you notice that, I mean, one of the questions I have is, do you notice um, if there's transfer from class to class? So, if there's philosophical inquiry of some kind happening in one particular class with one particular teacher, that it carries over into another class, which then may buttress support. I mean, it could go the other way, but um, that it would buttress support for keeping philosophy in the school for um, you know more and more teachers. So that's one part. You know that teachers are, teachers notice the kids who are being exposed to. Um, a philosophy program that they're more inquisitive that they're more engaged in their classes also so that's one part of the question and then the other part of the question is do you do you see kids then doing philosophy on their own like um like the example that christina gave i i had a similar experience of i had a cohort of kids in our philosophy camp who all went to the same high school and they started a philosophy club at their high school and then started an ethics bowl team and they just couldn't get enough and so i'm just curious whether you see, and I, what it, it didn't work out, but I kept hoping that organically it would spread, you know, <laughs> around the school. And I think had they been there, then we hit the pandemic. And so then, you know, it was just, you know, nobody was in school, but I'm just wondering if you've noticed any of those two kinds of activities that would help provide increasing support for keeping philosophy in a school or having it expand in a school. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'll speak to that first part. I mean, with, with the elementary level, you know, for most of our kids, they're with the same teacher for much of the day. So it's hard to say like, oh, you know, at a high school, if it's happening during a history block, does that carry over to math? So I can't speak exactly to that. But I will say, you know, in terms of getting started with philosophy, we started with our fifth grade team. And that was also the team that first started blending kids for social studies. So they were really set up to do that. And then um, after the first year, we had other teachers like, well, why do they get it? Because they had heard <laughs> good things that were happening about it. And so then we gradually, kind of like what Christina was saying, you move on the broken front and you go with the people who are ready. And when you have something that's really good, you do have those teachers that are like, how do we get that? We want that for our kids too. Um, we actually had the experience of one teacher who wasn't anti-philosophy, but also just didn't feel ready to take on managing something else, you know, and it is, it is a little something else that you have to schedule into your day. And so she wasn't signing up. And um, the next year, her kids who had had philosophy with another teacher the year before kind of insisted on it. And I think that was what <laughs> finally broke down her guard was interesting. Was, huh. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was kind of fun to see how that went. Um, and then, you know, the second part of the question about how does it carry over with students? Like how do they take what they've learned in philosophy and how does that show up other places? That's really hard to say because there's so many things that we're doing, you know, with, with our work with the levy with Colin, it really is about thinking about the interventions that we can provide to our kids 
to support, you know, the various goals that we have. And we try as much as possible to sort of streamline the things that we're doing. So all of our arrows are moving the same way um, across different interventions. So we have a number of things that we're working on where we're really trying to help kids exercise their voice and to know that that's what we care about. So we do have, we're, we are a school where kids will say, can we organize Pride Month? Sure. You know, mm. can we organize a climate change march? Sure. Can we have a protest about, you know, whatever, you know, we, we want our kids because that is, you know, that's what we're looking for in good citizens, right? It's like mm -hmm. people that know how to take action. They care about an issue. They're aware of an issue. They can build that excitement for their issue among other people. So, you know, we, we try to do that in lots of different ways, but I do think that philosophy supports those, you know, very same goals. And this year we're trying out, in addition to philosophy, we have a new partner called Speak With Purpose. I'm sure Colin's familiar. And it's an organization that blends social justice and public speaking. And so kids really are going to get that practice of learning about important issues about their own identity, culture, and race, and then learning how to put together, um, a speech or a poem or a rap or a song that really helps other people understand where they're coming from and also kind of ends in giving their audience a charge. So now, you know, so mm -hmm. this is what I'm going to do. Now, what are you going to do to mm -hmm. kind of build that excitement again around, you know, caring about what's happening in the world around you or even within your own family or your own school. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Anybody else want to take a stab at either of those parts? I mean, at the at the high school level, um, my my experience, and this is partly just the nature of the theory of knowledge class, um, because in that class you need to cover the connections between knowledge and a variety of disciplines, um, and so kids would absolutely be taking what we were talking about in our class into their um, history class or their science class or their math class, and um, and in some ways it gave. Uh, teachers permission to do things that they otherwise might not do, or a way of seeing things that they were already doing as connected to the theory of knowledge and connected to philosophy when they hadn't really recognized it before. Um, and and there's a, a science teacher that I'm thinking of in particular who, um, she is like the living, for those of you who know the magic school bus, she is the living Miss Frizzle. And um, she she's fantastic. Uh, kids love her. And she, you know, she had a whole um, uh, introductory unit on inquiry and inference that she was doing already using um, an activity that was like a, a series of, um, of uh, checks, like checkbook checks that, um, that you had to create a story out of. And you only got four at first, and then you got a few more, and then you got a few more. Um, and and being able to look at that and saying, well, no, this is absolutely doing philosophy in your classroom. You've already been doing it. And then as a result of some of the conversations with my students, um, she developed a whole uh, ethical angle to um, looking at the, the Haber-Bosch process. So, um, you know, essentially the, uh, the, the ethical concerns around um, the, uh, both the creation of artificial fertilizer and um, the fact that it created um, uh, cyanide gas that mm. was used to kill so many people, right? And so yeah. think, through the ethical considerations, mm -hmm. scientific, you know. I, I was actually wondering exactly that point with what John is doing, whether, because mm -hmm. because I think that the way that John described it, he was um, trying to sort of focus on ethics throughout the department, like, and, it, and I took that to mean within the humanities. And I was wondering whether either students report back or whether teachers report back or whether he overhears or can see that students are taking these ethical discussions into these other classes, whether it's you know science or you know history or you know something, um, something else outside of uh, you know English or you know sort of um, more focused uh, humanities classes. So I don't know whether you you have that information, whether you hear about it. Um, I actually have heard one thing. Um, at one point in, in English class, um, the English teacher pulled me aside and told me that, and this was, I think, in the third week of school. So I think this is good because it's only three weeks into the program and I have a teacher telling me something that happened. But um, it came up in the course of a novel they were reading um, about it, um, 
I, 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 I don't actually know what the book was, but one of the students from my ethics class was talking about, well, it seems like we're talking about the dilemma of, what was it? It was like, what's good versus what's right. And so, and they like had a conversation about like in, in the context of the novel, like, well, how can what's good be different from what's right? So I think that's my, that, that's my success report so far. <laughs> And the teacher reported this back to you. Is that what you were the? Um, yeah, they, they, yeah, yeah, like he, yeah, um, he passed me by in the hallway and just told me that a student was talking about my class. So, oh, that's I felt great. happy about that. Yeah. yeah. So elevate the discussion even in the other classes, hopefully also. Yeah. yeah, and and over time, like I mean, I've just been talking with the art teacher, and we've been talking about like during um, maybe like during February, like we can start like interdepartment um, conversations about racism and things like that. So um, I, I'm actually the humanities department. So I'm a one person department at my school. So um, <laughs> I have to kind of be very deliberate and uh, kind of pick myself into uh -huh. other departments to get collaboration going. But I have right. high hopes for the future with that. Right. So we we want I want to um like somewhere around seven uh, seven fifteen I'm looking at my my I haven't changed my I don't change my clock on my computer or I'll get completely confused but so it's it's um we have about five more minutes until it's about eight fifteen Eastern time and I want to make sure I leave enough time for um, people who are on the Zoom to not just ask questions in the chat but to open this up for a discussion so. Let me just, I just want to pose one more question just along the, along the same lines. If you were to give a piece of advice to someone who is hoping to introduce this into their schools, what would you, what would you say is the single most important thing that they can do when they approach a school or when they, if they're in a school, when they approach a principal or a superintendent, um, you know, what, what do you think is the, for you, what had been the largest obstacle and what would they, what do you, what would advice would you give them to try to overcome that or mitigate that? One thing my staff always jokes about is I love it when people bring me solutions versus problems. And so I would, you know, love to have uh, somebody who is coming to introduce this with a plan about how this is going to fit in our curriculum that we already have. Um, what would it be taking the place of? Because there's only a finite number of minutes in the day. And also, what's the plan for funding? Is there an idea for a grant? Is there already funding procured? That's what I would be looking for. I, I think I might add to that. Um, start by looking for where it's already happening. Mm -hmm. um, taking that that kind of strengths-based approach and being able to say you're, you're already doing the, it in these spaces or it meets you know it, it, it meets the needs or it helps accomplish things that you already have as goals um, and so look yeah looking looking for the low-hanging fruit um, and using that as an entry point yeah um, I guess just to to build on what, what's already been said um, like if your school maybe has a weakness in some area with ELA standards or socio-emotional learning, I think that there's elements of philosophy and ethics that can also, you know, you, you can highlight how those things could help what the school's already trying to achieve. Yeah, I was gonna comment on something similar. It's not clear to me that it would be necessary to take something away in order to implement philosophy into the curriculum. So it seems like you could take a philosophical approach to teaching certain concepts of mathematics or sciences, for instance. Mm -hmm. I think the question might be, um, whether the individual teacher feels um, comfortable doing that. I think the question of time usually comes in when somebody else needs to come in to introduce it into the classroom. I, Cause I know that I myself have had that experience of 
teachers coming to my educator workshops, loving the idea of it, but not wanting to do it themselves, which means that it, exactly what you're saying, rather than integrating it organically into their own lessons, which would take some time, but not, you know, obviously, you know, a half hour, an hour away from the whole day, somebody else needs to come in and they do need to carve out that space. So I think that in theory, you are absolutely correct. Um, the question is whether I think an individual teacher and then whether that if that teacher does want to do that, going for training, right? Whether the teacher is willing to go for training, whether there's a center nearby that can provide the training. Um, so you're right. Um, the question is what would be available? That's true. I was, I was thinking of it from a completely different perspective. So I, I am a philosopher. <laughs> and so I, I would think I was uh, taking that as obvious. But yeah, when I used to do philosophy outreach um, at the University of Colorado at Boulder, we would sell, it was easier to sell to high school teachers, mm -hmm. I feel like, because we could um, approach it as, hi, we can either give you some time off where you don't have to prep uh, for your lecture, or we can supplement something that you're already doing with your students. But then those lessons seem to be more targeted, um, targeted more towards uh, like honors classes. Mm -hmm. English mm -hmm. lit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I did a week long summer institute for teachers, uh, many of, of whom had had a little bit of exposure to philosophy in college, but had never continued with that. And um, uh, I saw a lot of anxiety about, you know, being ready, being good enough. And um, most of them expressed a desire to come back and do like a second year of that to kind of solidify. And that was uh, not possible for lack of funding and then uh, what pandemic. Um, but, but I do think that part of um, the larger mission would be to um, empower teachers and to kind of break down the barrier with teachers themselves. Because this idea that they cannot do it, you know, it's too difficult or whatever, it's not true. Of course, it requires some preparation, but um, they're perfectly, there. as an in, in intellectual profession, teaching is perfectly up to the task uh, mm -hmm. with a little bit of support, I think. Uh, but that requires uh, more institutional support and funding and resources that might be difficult to allocate to that purpose. Yeah, that's true. Because even my dean who loves everything, he is not going to give me $20,000 next summer <laughs> to run a summer institute, you know? <laughs> He likes it that he likes that it doesn't cost money. Right, right, right. All deans like when it doesn't cost money. Right. Okay, I wanted to open this up for um, questions from the other participants. If you have uh, questions that you'd like to ask the four panelists. Um, hello, everyone. I'm under the name. Uh, Damiana, but my real name is Carolina or Caroline. <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> for that. But yes, um, I'm interested uh, exact. I have uh, graduated in philosophy and I'm currently in my majors, but um, um, we have a course that uh, we, uh, we study during uh, my education and uh, then we have uh, practice we can go to have practice in different kindergartens or schools and now currently i'm interested uh, how how did you find or how did you manage to attract sponsorship because uh, i'm from bulgaria and here is really difficult for people engaged in philosophy with children to uh, sponsor themselves and to have really profit out of it or that's what my teachers have told me and I'm interested um, not only because I want to improve uh, philosophy with children here um, connected with all of your reasons and uh, many more 
but I want uh, people to be motivated and uh, to teach philosophy in different aspects of life and uh, of their um, own subjects, because it can be transferred to any kind of subject, uh, any kind of method can be transferred, and especially the methods of philosophy of children. So that's my first question. And uh, yes, maybe another question I would like to ask is uh, which problems are to be faced connected with the development of the philosophy of children, which is the, the biggest problem that you have encountered. Thank you. Right. Oh, go ahead, John. Oh, um, well, I was going to say my school district actually worked with um, the Ken Place School that um, Ariel is affiliated with, and um, they tapped into their foundation to purchase some curriculum uh, that I'm running in the school now for the um, for the sixth grade class and the seventh grade class, as well as um, some of their ethics school content or most of their ethics school content. So um, I've actually been, I, I'm, I'm gonna start an academic club running a lot of the KPS um, ethics bowl stuff. So that was, I, I think I can answer the second question with that one. I, I think in, in many cases, um, uh, philosophy for children and philosophy in, in schools is supported through philanthropic or grant money here in the United States. It's not, there's very little public funding um, for the, for that work. Um, and so whether it's, whether it's Plato or whether it's, um, uh, other, other grants that are available, I think that that's partly how, um, those, th these programs are being, um, subsidized. I just want to second what Colin's saying. Go, oh, go ahead, Colin. Go I know. Ahead. I, I, I realized I didn't. Um, I I didn't quite catch the second part of the question. Um, it was about uh, um, the problems that you're faced uh, while you develop a philosophy with children, because in one way or another, um, you you have to be very good communicators, not only with uh, children, but with parents. And I think I, I could agree that uh, um, uh, explaining to parents is uh, essential in order to... I know that uh, in, in your country, um, it is uh, more spread, a uh, philosophy with children is more spread, but here in Bulgaria, it's not very populated and it's underestimated and it has more negative connotation. Mm -hmm. So that's my... The negative connotations. Well, in Bulgaria we have, uh, don't, uh, don't philosophize, <laughs> like, don't be, um, it's an ex expression in Bulgaria, but um, people, the, the mass, person or <laughs> the masses they they just don't appreciate the philosophy as i think it should be and i think it is a revolutionary a revolutionary uh, subject that can if placed correctly it can uh, give the real revolution in minds that we want to achieve or that i want to achieve in general it's an interesting um, problem, isn't it? That philosophy on the one hand is perceived as elitist, but then when you try to give it to the masses, people get upset about that. So it's, um, we're sort of caught um, between a rock and a hard place, so. You know, I wonder if for um, the European context, you can just switch and call it American critical thinking or something like that, it might get you more <laughs> interest. Um, Yeah, but I, I agree with you, uh, Car Caroline, that um, actually I think organizing parent children or, you know, grown up children, um, philosophy for children events um, should be fantastic. Um, I've tried a couple of times with the public library, um, but so far it feels like it's more of a, um, 
it, it seemed more of a chance to drop your kid and go do something else. You know? <laughs> but I think it would be great because um, that would be uh, probably the best uh, advertisement also to the activity itself. Feeding people helps I, the, when, you know, in, in bringing, trying to bring parents in, um, pro, you know, providing some free food uh, and then, you know, sort of slipping discussion in later uh, is, is a helpful strategy. But I do, you know, I think it's, I'm, I'm, I'm glad the theme of, of the danger of it keeps coming up because I do think that, um, you know, my, when I was working with high school students, they reported, you know, that their parents found them to be more of a pain when, after they had taken my class. And I, I felt very proud of that. Um, but I also, you know, a, a student, you know, a young person who knows how to question established truths um, is a really dangerous thing. And, and I think we see this over and over again. Um, but but I think that that's, you know, in, in part, being able to welcome more people into the conversation is a way to diffuse some of the the edge of that, right? And, and being able to have multiple perspectives um, represented. Uh, Plato, Plato just hosted a um, uh, intergenerational ethics conversation, which I unfortunately was was sick and couldn't attend. But that's an, an example of ways that that might that might look is bringing older adults in with high school students and having some of those conversations happen across age boundaries. You know, I often joke about. Um you know, being in the profession where Socrates was asked to drink the hemlock and every once in a while, you know, saying, you know, thankfully they've not asked me to drink the hemlock yet. But, you know, like we sort of, like I say that sort of, you know, tongue in cheek, but it is true. I mean, that is, um, if you even look at the language, right? He was making people uncomfortable. And we hear that now. I mean, again, you know, I'm in Texas, so maybe my experience is, you know, more narrow than what other people are experiencing. But that's the language that you hear now with book banning, right? That it makes people uncomfortable. And so it's that same language. I mean, I don't think that we, we make light of it and, you know, but I don't think that we can really underestimate the power of people's perception that philosophy is dangerous. Um, it's very, it's very old, you know, that relationship is very old. So I, I, it's hard not to think about that as being sort of the first line of resistance of, you know, what is this going to do to my students? What is this, you know, that it's like something happening to them, which it is in a sense, but um, yeah. Yeah, uh, I also definitely feel that way in my context because of um, the, 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 re the uh, regulations I have to follow, but also just the emphasis on rigor like rigor, rigor, rigor. And like the, it, the perception is that this is questioning or uh, the perception among some is that this is questioning things. And like, it's not necessarily like what we're here to do in school. So I'm definitely trying to find a way to walk on a tightrope to, uh, you know, like not um, tear down, I guess, what, what we're trying to do, but also like actually do philosophy at the same time. So it's something I'm working on. <laughs> And just for the record, it doesn't end in the university either. It's the it, it's very similar. We just don't need parents' permission, but it's still a similar problem. Cynthia, you have your hand up. Cynthia Hess. So around my third year of teaching high school philosophy, which was back in 1995, I started a course in a high school. Um, I cleverly got it accepted as an A through J uh, class, which is required series of classes that you have to take in order to get into a university. And so it was under the auspices of an A through G at the time, an A through G required elective. And so tons of people took it because, you know, it qualified for something. So I had basically all the stoners and all of the um, valedictorians and um, salutatorians in one classroom, uh, up to 45 to 53 kids. And they would not split the class because they thought it was just a useless topic. And I said, okay, I'll keep all 53 of them. That's fine. And, and um, it was a very rewarding experience, but I noticed that the 
the push from parents was there. So in the third year, uh, on back to school night, I had a one hour session before back to school night and a one hour session after back to school night, telling the parents how they could talk to their kids and give them a voice and they could choose to see what their kids are saying as not disturbing and revolutionary, but as a place to share their values with them and help them to in, engage in conversation with their kids. Like you don't have to be afraid of your child. They're, they're, they're thinking of a lot of new things and you can, you can be there to talk to them about it. And that was really helpful in getting parent support because there were a lot of, I'm not saying anything bad about this, but a lot of right-wing people that were very hesitant to put their child in a philosophy course. And, and that was really helpful. Just go to where the problem is, go right to the parents and try to you know, help them to see the process of philosophizing. And about other teachers, yeah, I routinely got teachers saying, so you must have talked about blah, blah, blah in class because now the kids are asking me, how does economics have an ethical side? And I'm like, oh, how does it not? I mean, you're teaching them that, aren't you? <laughs> and they're like, well, no, we, it's not ethics. I'm like, oh, oh, well, if they're asking how it is ethics, maybe you should try to answer that. So just, you know, slowly drawing people in. And, you know, I, I was a philosophy major and a genetic engineering major at Berkeley. So everybody assumed I was going to be revolutionary. And in fact, that, that attracted quite a lot of kids to the class. Like you don't have to just, you can be revolutionary and not offensive. You can just state what you think. So those were some of the things I used to solve some of those problems. I hope that helps somebody. How did you, so, so if you take one step back, so you, you designed a class that became an elective that was required to get into, like one of, one of, the, one of the choices in order to get into college. How did you do that though? How did you, how did you design a class that then became one of these electives? So I, I went up to Berkeley, my philosophy department chair, Wallace Matson. I had become a good friend with him. And I said to him, hey, Wally, are there people who have philosophy classes in high school? And he said, well, of course, Cynthia. And I said, do you have any, any leads that I can follow? So I went to those people, there were three of them, and I got their curriculum and you know tailored it to my own taste. And then I went back and said, hey, Wally, you need to sign off on this so that it's a legitimate University oh. of California, A oh. through H acceptable course. And he said, well, I'll need to consider it. And I said, okay. And he made one suggestion and I put it in and he signed off on it. And then voila, it was an A through G acceptable course. And that, oh. that had made it get on the sheet where they could pick it. And you very interesting. A teacher signature. Yeah. So I yeah. got to meet each student and, you know, and they all knew me in one way or another. So that's an, that's an interesting perspective from, for if you're in a high school to, um, I mean, I, and I think that now there's some version of an AP course that, that rarely gets taught because people don't have the credentials to teach it. That's one of the problems. There's a course that has been designed that looks like a philosophy class, but I know that there's a lot of discussion. There's a lot of discussion from university philosophy faculty about supporting that because the worry is that students will take that class and then not take classes in college. That'll be the one class that they, you know, they, they AP out of, but also that it doesn't really resemble what a philosophy class would look like in the university. So there's a lot of, um, tension about this. So this so, is an interesting way to approach it as an elective that would then, that would get so, people interested. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I just hybridized it and made it like a college course. I mean, we covered, yeah. we covered some philosophers and, and then found ways to talk about them and criticize them and, you know, and, and see what's good in them. But, but, um, ah, what was I going to say? The, um, the, the root of taking it through an already approved genre. Oh, there is no AP philosophy course. As, as, as far as I know, there, I, I looked for it 
No, every, it's, it's not under, it's not under the word philosophy. It's a, I forget what it's called, but they, but the college board has designed something that ah. it's something like, I don't want to say theory of knowledge, but it's something like that. Well, that's fabulous. That's fabulous. But in 1995, nobody was, I mean, people were laughing about that. Yes, that's it. Thank you, Allison. The capstone. Oh, the capstone. Right. Right. So anyway, that's how I kind of got around some of that stuff. Yeah. And that's great. That's great. Okay, last last pieces of advice. You have 30 seconds. It's um 8:32. I'm just going to say thank you for uh, having me be part of the panel. It was really fun to get to hear what's happening in other places and hopefully something I shared was able to help someone. I actually have to run for a PTA meeting, so okay. I will thank you. I just say uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for to. thank you for participating. It was great. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, good night, everyone. Good night. Anyone else? Thank you for doing this. It's really cool. And thank yeah. you for putting that piece of paper up that tells when the other events are. Uh, it's yeah, it's really, really helpful. Oops. Okay. Really, really fabulous. Thanks. So I was looking at the piece of paper that had the other events on it. And from what I can tell, is it? Am I correct in thinking that the only ones that um, require payment is the curriculum writing workshop? I think that's right, um, Ariel. And if you want to put something in the chat, the roundtables and the webinars, as far as I know, are free. That is true. Yes. Okay, great. And there's one next week on community of inquiry. Yes. Or community. That of P4C and community. Perfect, perfectly timed. Great, thank you. Yep. Okay, well, I wanna be respectful to the panelists for sure. It looks like there's still people who have um, hands up. I don't know if you wanna email Plato directly or um, if I, I think that um, Christina put her email address farther up in the chat if um, people wanna email their questions directly. But I wanna thank, um, I, I, you know, thanking um, Katie, but thank uh, John, Colin, and Christina, and um, Plato for organizing this. Thank you all for having us and inviting us.